Well, yesterday I talked about the importance of trade and travels uh, as a main carrier I mean, of, uh, of goods and people and even languages <coughs> during the second millennium BC with some uh, migrations, but mainly the interaction was the main source. Uh, the third millennium, I suggested, would rather be characterized by migrations rather than systematic interaction. And I would go and look further into the uh, late fourth and third millennium BC. Uh, and what I would do is that I would in a way complement what we have already heard from David, because I would look rather into the nature of social institutions and the role of social institutions uh, in uh, during this period. Um, so I put up certain preconditions for what we as archaeologists uh, can do to identify uh, migrations <coughs> as carriers of language change. And what I'm offering is really some archaeological scenarios. And then the historical linguist will would have to decide and pick. I make, of course, uh, suggestions. And I hope in the discussion afterwards uh, today, we'll be able to perhaps to narrow uh, and come a little closer uh, to, some, to some solutions uh, or some suggestions for future research. Now, let me begin by presenting some preconditions. Because if we wish to compare archaeological evidence with language, uh, I would suggest that the most reliable point of connection are institutional and technological clusters, not single elements. Single elements are too random, in my, in my, uh, in my uh, in, uh, opinion. We need more complex things like material clusters of social institutions that can be then eventually identified uh, through language. So what we can offer as archaeologists is to we can we can we can date and show the distribution of certain social institution and certain technological clusters or innovations. And also, if a migrations were part of the early expansion of Indo-European languages, we as archaeologists must be able to point out a demographic buildup that can explain a subsequent expansion. And this condition is in part provided, I would suggest, uh, on the Russian steppe uh, from the northern Carpathians into the Ukraine during the fourth millennium, with the gradual collapse, as we've already heard about, uh, of the last two poly communities of tens of thousands of people uh, uh, that would subsequently have to disperse and form new, a new, for, a new, new kinds of social, uh, social uh, uh, institutions. And this condition is also in part provided by the collapse of the last fortified communities from Spain, from the east to the west, from seaboard and San Buyal during the early third millennium BC, where we would see another uh, migration uh, moving out. <coughs> These early migrations, I suggest, did not lead automatically to continued interaction. Regular interaction is only uh, uh, emerging with uh, systematic trade metal, um, which is a hallmark of Bronze Age societies. So I shall now be looking uh, mainly into the third millennium, while I yesterday looked into the second millennium BC. Now, to begin with, just to exemplify this difference between the third and second millennium, there's some recent research published with network analysis that exemplify this in a, in a rather straightforward uh, way. To the left, you see here uh, some recent work from Copenhagen uh, Institute here of, of, of uh, late Neolithic or Copper Age interaction networks, and you see how they form islands of interaction that are not connected. It's only when we get into the Bronze Age that all these islands are connected into a huge, huge interregional network of systematic interaction. And that is the main difference between the fourth, third millennium and the second millennium onwards. I will start by looking at the Caucasus. 
and to the, uh, a little bit, a very brief encounter into the archaeology of the Caucasus. As a point of communication between Mesopotamia and the early steppe societies in the fourth millennium. And I believe there are certain things, this interaction had uh, implications for the development of uh, new forms of social institutions during this period that would then spread on uh, to the step. And which are, while technological innovations or horse riding are sort of clear cut things that you can demonstrate archaeological, I will be talking about social institutions and they are a little bit harder to demonstrate. But I would suggest also that the, the formation of these social institutions that would carry on the spread of Indo-European language are then tightly linked up with the formation of urbanism and state societies in the Near East, and therefore belongs in the Bronze Age. So the early contact with Mesopotamia uh, uh, during the Uruk period of colonization to the north of, uh, um, is a defining moment, I would suggest, where colonizers and traders meet with, um, in a way, with step societies uh, uh, and uh, in the Caucasus, and when they start large-scale metal working and mining, because Mesopotamia had no copper and they needed copper, and these Uruk expansion was, in a way, uh, settlers that would uh, go for mining and, pro and, and exploit them to get copper back to Mesopotamia. And in the process, local communities in the Caucasus prospered and created this so-called mica culture, uh, characterized by advanced metalwork. But this metalwork also spread rather immediately to the steppe societies, where we find graves that shows with uh, with, uh, that shows that they were actually uh, doing, uh, doing uh, metal work um, in the steppe. And I have shown here uh, these uh, graves and finds uh, that, that connects this whole area in a way from the steppe to Eastern Europe, uh, the Aegean, and, uh, and Anatolia. And here we have some examples from the mica culture that prospered in, in the Caucasus. And uh, we bury uh, the dead in, 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 in Kurgans, but the inventory is certainly not a uh, step inventory. These are things uh, uh, to a large extent uh, derived from Mesopotamia. And you will see up here to the left corner, you will see that horse. That we, that, That's the one I couldn't show. That you want to show. <laughs> yeah, the step horse. Uh, and to the right, you'll see here the mica culture, and you'll see the transmission of that m m metal uh, technology to the uh, to the to the uh, to the uh, steppe societies north of, uh, of uh, uh, the northern Caucasus and, and further on. So it's transmitted uh, uh, rather fast uh, onto the steppe. And what does that imply? Well, first of all, of course, it implies that you are developing a more complex society with metallurgists, um, uh, and, but also the role of the metallurgy suggests that we are developing a more ranked society with, uh, with, with, uh, with the social institutions of rank linked to, for instance, uh, daggers and swords. Uh, which are quite similar to what we have further south in Anatolia or Aslan Tepe or, uh, or other places. And to the right you see some of the mines uh, during recent years, um, uh, the IE, the German Institute and others uh, have done a lot of work here and to document these early mining, um, uh, both gold mining and copper mining. And I'm sure in the future we'll see a lot more uh, evidence coming forth here about the importance of the Caucasus uh, supply, supplies of, of copper and gold uh, in the early uh, Mesopotamian rural period and onwards. And the impact that would have uh, as, a, as a bridge between the steppe and Mesopotamia. And as we see here, to the left, we see one of those symbols of uh, godly symbols that you at the same time find as the goddess Istar in Mesopotamia holding her hands. So 
What I'm <laughs> saying here is that there are real strong connection and, and borrowing uh, in the Caucasus at this time from Mesopotamia. And they, what they do uh, borrow, uh, not only a new technology, but also a more complex society, they selectively borrow uh, parts of a new complex society that I suggest is linked to, is linked to property, inheritance, some, perhaps some legal, um, uh, legal things. So, uh, with, once you have property, and uh, then they, property can be, need to be, uh, be, be distributed at death in, uh, through inheritance. And if you have property that has to be distributed at such occasions, the burial becomes incredibly important event uh, for, for doing this. And that's, in my opinion, why we see what, uh, that the Kurgan with these individualized uh, burials is, an, is, an, is an, in a way a materialization of these new institutions where also you define legally males and females as distinct uh, the persons with social identities and rights to property. And that's why we see from this period onwards these individual, uh, individualizing burials with part of their property, because this was a time when property had to be redistributed. <coughs> so we see a new perception of in the individual as a legal I social identity linked uh, to property rights. Probably we also see the monogamous marriage being, uh, being the, the family institution that would, and this kind of social, of, of, uh, legally defined social family would continue for the next uh, several thousand years as a dominant family pattern in European in European societies. And I suggest that they inherited that from Mesopotamia or took it over from Mesopotamia and carried it on uh, from that on. And here we see then we have heard from David these uh, these migrations, the early expansion of the Proto-European speaking populations. Uh, down uh, to um, uh, the Danube and uh, Hungary. And at that time, we have certain other cultures, uh, late Neolithic uh, or Neolithic cultures already persistent in, in Europe. Um, but in the next one, we have here in some uh, a major article that came in Presto Science five or six years ago that summarized a lot of this. The material culture, as I've already shown you, of these Yamnaya populations and their new institutional packets uh, as an expansionist social formulation formation that he has summarized um, by Volker Haidt and Harrison in their article. I have made my own <coughs> sort of more visual uh, 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 <laughs> synthesis. Of what 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 happened here? Of uh, this new social formation of, in, of Indo European speaking populations that would expand westwards into into uh, Europe and later on eastwards, as we have heard, into the eastern steppe and Iran. Basically, we have the family barrow, which now becomes the locus of the transmission of property between generations. It's a vertical transmission. And I suggest they define the free men or the free families, the free lineages, the chief lineages, anthropologists would call them. I just prefer to call them free because you had unfree as well. Because what we know is that only a very small uh, part of the population were buried here. And they, uh, we have alliances becomes very important. Vertical systems of alliancing uh, where you could Transmit, transfer uh, property and, and mostly links to cattle and sheep, of, of course, between alliance, alliance partners. And finally, all these new systems of property, inheritance, contracts, uh, and etc., would demand a whole new set of, uh, of uh, rules. Some would call them laws, but here we require, I would rather call them rules, 
uh, but also rituals that had to be people had you would have to have people who were in command of these rules and who would also be able to transmit them orally. And that really takes off this system that was formed during the late fourth millennium and expanded during the third millennium and it really, really takes off uh, with the advent of the Bronze Age. But now we will look at the third millennium. So I have summarized here from um, um, from Mallory's work, I've just taken here to the the, the, low, the lower part is the Yamnaya with the expansion, and then the later the corded ware expansion, which is a, an adaptation and transformation of Yamnaya uh, <coughs> social and economic institutions adapted to a temperate European environment, which happened after 3000 BC. And to our most, you see the Andronova expansion, we have heard about yesterday as well. Just a brief summary of what we already heard. So you know where we are in time and space. Now, I will now look into a little more of these more recent network analysis that are really, uh, that are really showing some interesting things. Uh, here we have to the left a network analysis of pottery mainly uh, from the late fourth uh, millennium in southeastern Europe, showing that despite you have different pottery style, you have Bard, you have others, they are, they are integrated through a number of shared elements. So already before the expansion, uh, already before the taking over and expansion of the, of the corded ware uh, uh, network or Yamnaya networks, you had already uh, networks that were starting to expand. But to the right, we see the corded ware battle axe integrated cultures a network analysis of their burial rituals. And I think that's interesting because it shows a structural homology or structural similarity between all these uh, communities spread out through temperate northern Europe. And they will soon develop very local, uh, local styles, but at the moment of migration, and when you analyze their burial rituals, you can really show that there is a deep structural connectivity between them that can only be explained through, uh, through the adaptation of a similar, a, similar, a similar social organization and ritual organization linked to migrations. Otherwise, it couldn't spread so fast. Now, the supposed origin of the Singwed culture, just because now we are in Denmark, um, we take a little brief look into that, which has been suggested to come down from the northwestern Germany and moving up into Jutland, Western Jutland, and further down to Holland. And um, to me, it's very clear it's a migration. I have always stated that. Um, and I think for good reason, but we'll have the answers soon from our DNA. Uh, but osteologically speaking, there is a clear difference between the populations of the singular battle axe culture and, and the megalithic culture. Here we see a typical landscape of this, like step-like landscapes of Jutland. Uh, this is a photograph from around 1900. And, uh, but for, for, first and foremost, we have the pollen evidence, which shows the most radical deforestation in any, anywhere in, in, in uh, northern Western Europe. It takes place with the advent of the single culture. They simply cut down two thirds of all forest and they create large, large uh, open lands for grazing the herds. And when we take pollen sample from the barrows, it's very clear that, that they maintained it open. They burned off and the heat starts to expand because they were herders. And we can find no, no, not a trace of their houses because they were mobile. <coughs> we have now stripped off with machines many square kilometers in Jotland, and we would have found them. It would lead to uh, a migration of this corded ware social formation throughout northwest, north, northern, uh, central northwestern Europe, through a migration, and they would carry what would have to be some kind of, uh, 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 some kind of proto, proto or pre-Germanic languages, I would suggest. Uh, but the, the important thing is the social institutions. 
because I think it's through a comparison of the social institution we can demonstrate in the archaeology with what the language uh, will is able to tell us about social institutions at that time. That is really the point of discussion here and what we should be looking for. Now to the, to the Celtic languages. I will talk about the archaeology that uh, provides some scenarios. To the right, you have your, we, have, we have the old model saying that, that Celtic would sort of originate in, 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 in Central Europe and spread out from there. And of course, we know that there is a spread to the, to the east during the Latin period, uh, uh, fourth, fifth, fourth uh, century. Uh, but that's very late. But there's absolutely no way that we archaeologically can document any westward exp expansion of any archaeological so-called Celtic culture to either to England or to or to the Iberian Peninsula. That model is simply obsolete. The archaeology will not support it. What we what we have to the left is a model of bell beakers, uh, expanding bell beaker societies. And we know now through strontium isotopes that bell beakers societies were really on the move. They were mobile. They were mi so migrating in small groups as um, a specialist met 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 metallurgists uh, and warriors, bowmen, and they were maritime. They were the first efficient uh, sailors uh, with the maritime technology that would allow them to expand uh, um, on sea. And here to the left is uh, Needham's model of the expansion out of the Iberian Peninsula, which is quite well documented archaeologically. They are earlier there than in other places, up through France, and then merging with the corded ware complex and creating a fusion between the two, uh, and then moving on to England uh, from there. That is an archaeological model that would account for the spread of Celtic to, to France, and but not least <coughs> to, to, to England. It's very difficult to see any later uh, archaeological models that would be able to account for, 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 for that. Now, the question then is, but what language did these people speak that came from, from, from Spain and Portugal? Uh, we don't know, of course. Uh, would that be any form of a non-European language? Could Celtic have derived out to the, a meeting between a non-European and European, uh, an Indo-European language? I don't know. But let's look a little closer, a little further south. Now we know that these Belgian societies, they look, they have a lot of resemblance to the to the court that were in certain ways, but they were more specialized. They were metallurgists. They were maritime specialists, uh, and also uh, they had been in contact with more complex societies on the Iberian Peninsula that collapsed. So they would bring with them some ideas of more complex societies. <coughs> now, we have new evidence from uh, uh, teeth morphology studies, which is a very interesting field. Um, so here's a recent uh, 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 work where an osteological uh, analysis of 2,000 Belbig individuals all over Europe, uh, because teeth morphology is, uh, is in a way uh, genetically determined. So the way your teeth fold is not random; it, it, they fold in patterns, and these patterns are linked to. To, to, to the to, to in one way and on the other to, to, to genetic variation I suspect but they they, they are they, they are patterned and you can distinguish <laughs> the different morphological patterns for different populations so the so this study simply showed that you have these you have these patterns and you can show that there is that the Portuguese Iberian dental patterns is moving and up into parts of, of uh, Central uh, Central Europe. So, the, so this dental study confirms the archaeology 
that there is a movement out of Iberia and up to uh, parts of uh, parts of Central and and, um, and Northern Europe. Um, here, there is a degree of local foreign in Belgian population, and it's very interesting. Hungary is the place where there is a real migration of uh, apparently down from from uh, from Iberian uh, uh, Peninsula. Also, um, whereas in uh, uh, in, and also in southern France, uh, there, there's no local population. It's a replacement. <coughs> Other parts in, in Czech Republic, it's, a, it's partial. It's a mix. <coughs> and to the right, I show you some recent pottery studies uh, up on the, from the Atlantic coast that shows there are extreme similarities <coughs> from Portugal <coughs> to Jutland in pottery styles suggesting that there is a real there is a real maritime migration going on here right from the Iberian Peninsula up to Jutland. If we move further, uh, if we, let's move on here. Now, to the left, there are the Celtic place names. There's a new book that came out two years ago, Celtic from the West. <laughs> so there is a whole new group of researchers who uh, in part based both, both uh, language people, uh, place name people and archaeologists who due to the difficulty of the old model are now looking to the west for the, uh, the origin of Celtic. Uh, and as I'm trying to show you there is, there is quite a lot to it from an archaeological point of view. But the place names show exactly the same distributions as I've been showing you for the Bell Beakers. Uh, you're from 2500 BC down to 2000 BC. So there's much here that corresponds. And to the right, I have shown a, 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 from one of the, uh, the language articles, because there's one of the linguists who claimed, well, there's some difficulty with the model uh, because. Uh, Celtic uh, language shows that it must have been in contact with, I think it's uh, Old Italic, Greek, Albanian. Uh, so, how come? I mean, we have this beautiful correspondence with the Belbica expansion and the Celtic place names, but how would we bring them in contact with Old Italic or Greek or Albanian? Um, then we have to look further into the Mediterranean, because Belbigas are distributed uh, in, uh, in, in a large part also of the Western, Western Mediterranean. Uh, now here I summarized again from Harrison and, um, and Volker Haidt. Again they show this, that's the alternative model that we heard from David, that, uh, that Italic at least could have come <coughs> from people moving from Hungary down to northern Italy. Or, uh, and as I showed, there are clear connections during the Bronze Age, back and forth <coughs> between northern Italy and Hungary. So there, there are a longer durée here. Uh, that, but also you see here that there is a meeting of bell beakers uh, here in northern Italy, <coughs> in France, uh, and Hungary. In, again, around northern Italy. So it, that is a, a zone of interaction uh, between bell beakers. But still, where, what language do they speak? And where did they come from? How do we create the link to Old Italy? Or maybe some link here to Old Italy uh, we, we find. Um, but still, so I have been, there's a, some recent work also done on the, uh, I just show you two maps here uh, from bell beakers in the Mediterranean. Because we have actually that they have been looking into the origin of certain of the basic uh, deco uh, elements of uh, painting and decoration that is uh, used on bell beakers in the Western Mediterranean, <laughs> and they find the origin of that uh, in the area of, of, of Greece and the southern Adriatic <coughs> area. So. If bell beakers, maritime bell beakers, originated in that region and then created their bell beaker culture on the way towards the west, they first settled in, we find them, <coughs> you, see, uh, you, you see, we find them in Sicily, 
um, uh, and, and further on to southern France, Iberia. And in southern France, it can be, has been demonstrated in some recent work that they're colonies and they expand like colonizers. Uh, the pattern is totally comparable to the Greek expansion. There's a very interesting article recently that, that demonstrates that similarity. So these are colonists, maritime colonists. So the suggestion here is that, in fact, they originate in the Aegean and the southern Adriatic. And then they move westwards and to the Iberian Peninsula, France, and from there on northwards, and ultimately to England. So now we have the connection, at least from an archaeological point of view. Now I will finally move on to uh, and round off, off here with some of the patterns that expansion that David also talked about. That is the expansion of the chariot uh, and, of, uh, and of this military complex uh, originated in Sintastra. But as you can see, having a rapid westward expansion, it, there has been a series of C14 dates that, that shows that that expansion is taking place in a very brief period between 2000 and 1800 BC. <coughs> and some people, some people would see that. Now we are down to the question that Mallory raised uh, uh, yesterday also. Uh, could there also be a late uh, scenario for, for some of the Indian languages linked to the Bronze Age? Uh, now, if my model of the of, 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 of the bell beakers and and uh, Kelpie has uh, stands uh, uh, holds, then we need Greek to come early from the step with one of those movements that David showed us. So then this would be too late, but at least they go the whole way down. These are the bits and show this rapid expansion of that military complex, which is not only a military complex, it's a complex of social institutions, because it demanded an enormous support. It demanded specialists to train the horses. This is the beginning of the dressage. You need to be able to control your horse, to be able to, to, to control your, your, to do what you want to do in a chariot fight. You need to be able to stop it, to turn it, to back it, to do all kinds of things with your horse. And this is dressage. Uh, you need these kind of specialists, and you need other kinds of specialists. Uh, so, so this is a highly complex rank society, warrior society that is expanding here. And then the question is, what we find in, in, in language that can correspond to it, and it goes a whole way down to the to the to the Mycenaean, uh, to the early Mycenaeans, and we find them even in in, 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 in burials here. And actually, there is, there, is a, there is a burial of two horses. Uh, there are horse burials uh, uh, in the close, in, if not Mycenae, then in the area around there, that are dated to the early Mycenaean period. And the osteologists are telling us that these horses are of the Asian breed. They come from the steppe. This is then, consequently, another opportunity for Greek. The latest possible. I'm not saying it's the most likely, but it's, I'm saying it's the latest possible. And again, during this period, connected to this expansion, we see here the Caucasus again, and uh, northern, uh, northern part of Asia Minor. Uh, we see here the flourishing of metal prospecting and trading the, with the formation of trialetic culture. Uh, and where you find all the kind of things that you find in the early shaft graves uh, 100 or 150 years later. And they are burying their dead in huge, huge crocans with huge chambers and long, long uh, ceremonial roads leading up to them. Uh, and again, we know this is exactly the period of the old Aturian trade and the, uh, in Anatolia, and where the old Assyrians we know were in control of not only the textile trade and the tin trade, 
the most recent research tells us that the letters we have that describes that trade is now within a 30-year period. Uh, around uh, in the um, in the early <coughs> 19th century BC, and 150 tons of tin is documented have been traded to uh, to these Hittite kings. <coughs> the Hittite kings. We had Hittite place here at that time, um, and I don't know how many textiles, but a lot. But what we also know from the more recent research is that they controlled or the copper trade inside Asia Minor. And we know that the trade that brought the copper to the north, uh, to the, uh, in the northern mountains, if not in Caucasus, then the northern mountains. And they would ship the copper the whole way through Anatolia to the west, where they would then be sold off to probably Minoan or Mycenaean communities out there. So the possibility, in fact, exists here that the copper that made the Mycenaeans rich and which they sold off to the Minoans came the whole way down through Anatolia and was sold off and, sh and shipped off to Mycenae. Because once Mycenae starts, you get all the same kind of, of, of things and, and rapiers and, and the like in their graves. So they're part of the same cultural uh, economic system. So there is a system here that is working on a grand scale, and that also moves people. And I mean, uh, and these shipments that we hear about in the letters from the from the uh, from the from the merchants in in Karnesh is, I mean, they typically ship like 15 or 30 tons of copper at a time. And the and if you take 150 tons of copper within 30 years and say that there was 10% tin, 10% 10 tin in copper. I mean, how many thousand tons are you getting uh, of bronze? It gives, this, it gives you an idea of the scale of the metal economy once, you, once it got started. And it gives you an idea of why these societies were so connected. And, and people and language would spread in completely new ways once we are after 2000 BC. Now, let's look here at some DNA. Uh, here we have the step again. And we, that was recently published uh, some evidence, and Morton may, may be able to explain it better than I. But uh, you have some graves out there, uh, the crosses here and here, that were analyzed for, I think, mitochondrial DNA, but they were also looking both uh, female and male lines. And the, I think the female lines are those that show inter, intermarriage along the way. And the male lines, uh, uh, the male lines, uh, they are blank here, and they have all their, their relatives, modern relatives are in Europe, from Scandinavia down here. And here, you see on the female lines, they have all their modern relatives are from, from Greece to Scandinavia. So again, there is a connection here, a genetic connection from Siberia, late Bronze Age, early Iron Age burials, to modern days Europeans. Now, we hope to be able to fill some of these gaps with real ancient DNA. Um, and uh, that leads me on to, that was one of the things you couldn't see, the one to the right, yeah, uh, from David, right? right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. There's a barrel with the, with the lances, and the uh, and the um, yeah the javelins. Um, so and again, I'm just, I, I have to mention my divine twins, of course, um, because the, the religion was spreading at the same time as these uh, the chariot and the expansion of these uh, chariot uh, warriors from Sintasta to India to the Carpathians, to Scandinavia. And that's why we find such incredible similarities between Scandinavia and, in, in, and India. The text in India describe exactly what we have in Scandinavia in 1500 BC, because there was a historical connection. And now we, we also can see there is a DNA connection. 
And then the question is, what was the language connection? And was this too late? Or do we have to go back in the third millennium? That, I think, is something we should discuss this afternoon. So, summary. Earliest area for the formation of these agro-pastoral economies so that they've described so excellently. Um, I suggest that what we have been overlooking is the formation of <coughs> social institutions uh, of ranked or more complex societies that was taken on board from Mesopotamia. And uh, new definitions of family, property, inheritance, etc. And I also suppose, propose here that I have not had the time to go into this, that there is a back movement from the Caucasus to the south uh, into Anatolia, which, uh, archaeologically speaking, which very well could account for the early Hittites. So rather than see them coming down to the west and moving in from the west, where you have Lumians, I would rather see them coming down from the Caucasus into the central area where we have Hittites by 1900 BC. Uh, and they should have moved down then by the late 4th millennium. The expansion of the Yamna culture into the Carpathians with influence areas in northern Italy and Balkans is a possible first origin of these languages. Northwest of the Yamna culture, a new version of this Econo agro-pastoral economy is adopted, and it comes accorded where agriculture, syncopy, battle axe cultures uh, <coughs> spreading very quickly within one or two hundred years. The first possible candidate of pro-Germanic pro in my is my suggestion here. From the western Mediterranean Portugal, a new social technological package of migrating bell beakers spread northwards and southeastwards where they mix with Proto-Germanic-speaking people and later migrate to England. First possible Proto-Celtic. Possible origin, or origin in Greece, Aegean, Adriatic area. During the early second millennium, a new western and eastern expansion of chariot-drawing warrior societies, the latest possible introduction of Greek expansion of proto -Euro or Euro Iranian. So that this these are my suggestions, but basically what I have to offer here is really some archaeological scenarios and some social institutions that would allow us to, to enter into a more complex uh, discussion of what kind of societies were behind the languages. Thank you. Now it seems that, uh, and thank you, Mr. Christian, for this enlightening talk. It seems now that we have uh, about uh, a quarter of an hour for discussion. So, so we please. need not fill it because we'll have a full discussion at the end, right? Yeah, that's true. But... <laughs> Would you leave your last slide? Yeah. Because I will ask some more questions. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> The, um, the origin of the Iberian bell beakers, uh, the poss possibility of a Greek or a or an Aegean origin for that, um, that's fascinating. I, I've never seen that before. Uh, no, it came in a book that only came like two years ago. Uh -huh. um, and the, it's, a, it's a suggestion of uh, the motif or the... Yeah, you know, it's rather thin eyes. Uh -huh. Because because you you really say that that I mean uh, no one has really been able to explain in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a convincing way where the bell beaker pottery style and and also the painting way derives from it's very distinct yeah. and it's very similar the whole way up yeah. and so so it's it's Guillaume, uh from France who has done this study together with Tusa and where they map out, look at the whole Mediterranean. And they say, if we are going to, the only place we can find the components that go into the formation of the bell beakers is in this Aegean Adriatic region. And what, do you remember what period it was in the Aegean that they were looking at? You know? Yeah, it has to be slightly before then. It will have to be, I don't know, 2800 BC or yeah, something. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, so, so these 
possible kelp from the Aegean where they what sort of way of migration did they belong to? Yeah, I mean, what, what the, the suggestion is, I mean, we know that the bellbeakers were really maritime specialists. And they, they were the really first uh, groups of people who, who, who were able to, to efficiently, you know, move on sea <coughs> uh, over long distances and with a lot of people yeah. on board. And that could take them the whole way up to Jutland, around, you know, to Iberia, and they settle in Iberia for... There is a whole question. We don't have to make, we don't have cut C14 days from Sicily. Uh, you know, we have C14 days from Portugal and from from from, from Spain that place them um, one or two hundred years earlier than than in in, 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 in north in Central Europe and, and northwestern Europe. So that makes sense. Yeah, you can show that there is a migration going on. But actually, we, we cannot really date. Uh, we haven't dated the Sicilian. Um, uh, Sardinian uh, beakers, and there are a lot of them, and they are incredibly beautiful. Uh, but we need to date them. But does it mean that you, you don't have a sort of a, before they appear there, you don't have an idea of where they came from? Or no, they and you know, this is really not my field of research. Oh, yeah. I have only been looking into some of the more recent publications, and, 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 mm. and someone, some, someone else and me, who are like Guillaume or TUSA, who are the specialists, uh, they should be invited to, to, to fold out the whole picture. Yes, one more question regarding that. Presumably, they would also have been on the southern shores of the Mediterranean, if you were Tunisia. Yeah, so, yeah, so yeah. You that's know true. If, 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 if this is really understudied, but you have them in North Africa, too. So, so one some, might think, some. So, so one might think they might have picked up some words from there. I mean, there are these theories about uh, uh, North African uh, influence in Celtic. I cannot answer that question. I can only say what the archaeologist is, is saying. Do you get your question as well? Yeah, it was. I mean, if you look at it from a purely linguistic point of view. Many people just believe that uh, Celtic and Italic, that's sort of a common branch of group on the one hand. And then there's this sort of Balkan group consisting of uh, Greek, Albanian, Armenian, and perhaps in the distance to Kerala. And uh, how would you? I can only present the archaeological yeah. scenarios. And, and what, what I'm interested in, and what I think we should discuss this afternoon, is that. That, that we as archaeologists can present the, mm -hmm. the kind of social organization yeah. we uh, think were behind them and the institution or the, and the technological complexes. But what we would like from you, I mean, I think each of us should in a way formulate a list of wishes. <laughs> you know, I would like to have from the historical linguist, you know, uh, uh, a series of wishes from your side or, or that, that, or a series of things that are possible and not possible. So, for instance, um, this thing about uh, about Celtic, I picked it up because I I wanted to know more about it. So, so I came over these these uh, language people who say so. Suddenly, I could see okay, but it doesn't work with the, my Portuguese, France, English model because it's. There's no connection to because the language people tells me that there has to be a connection to, to it, it, Italic or, or Albanian or Greece, and that's why because because I was told I, I read that article, I started looking to the Mediterranean. So in a way, what we need from the linguists, we need lists of what each language allows us and doesn't allow us, what the demands are on the archaeologist uh, to be fulfilled and what is not possible. And likewise, we can provide scenarios where we can say, these are, these, these are possible scenarios that fulfill some of your criteria. So I think we're only beginning to have a dialogue. Yeah. Yeah. And if we're going to have a dialogue, you have, we, have, we have to have research centers <coughs> where the archaeologists and, and language people together, mm -hmm. and not only one. <laughs> 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 Unfortunately, this does not happen. 
You know, uh, this is one of my great, but this is really probably better for the afternoon. But, uh, you know, American, American archaeology graduate students get no training in, in linguistics. Um, in fact, uh, the standard assumption is that it's impossible to link uh, material culture, the subject of archaeology, and life. So uh, uh, that's the default assumption in uh, uh, departments uh, in the United States. But here is, here is a research yeah. a group yeah. and the research institute. That assumption, I think, uh, is wrong. And in a way, so what I'm saying is that there ought to be at least one archaeologist among you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, any, any more questions from the audience? Yeah, just out of curiosity, I didn't understand the thing with deforestation in Japan. Uh, what is the point of deforestation if you don't, if you're not, if you're mobile? But the whole uh, the thing is the, the the reason they 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 burn off the forest. Yes, yes. You cannot cut that for much forest. They burn off the forest, and the forest was rather light, open, so it wasn't that difficult to you know. So they burn off the forest on Western Jutland to create the kind of environment they came from. Because they bring with them a herding economy that demands prairies or huge pastures. And they move into areas, they typically move into areas with least resistance that were not heavily settled. And these areas are typically the more sandy areas that the real agriculturalists had not settled. <laughs> and they were perfect for herding economy. And they, because they could easily burn off the forest and then create all these 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 prairie-like uh, landscapes and heath landscape, and they would continuously keep burning them off. You know, uh, we can see that in pollen uh, diagrams. That, uh, so, so it's very clear that they wanted to create the kind of environment that they knew and came from. And just one comment on that, if I could. Uh, in uh, this reminded me. In Bulgaria, they don't have the intensity of uh, paleobotanical research that you have uh, in Denmark. But uh, what there has been uh, suggests that the uh, big tell settlements, uh, very, very stable agricultural societies, yep. uh, did not have a tremendous effect on the forest cover. But after the tells are abandoned and these uh, simple pastoral societies come in, the forest cover declines rapidly. Yeah. The yep. same thing. They they yep. they got rid of the forest after the towns are abandoned. Is when the real impact on the forest. Yeah. So same. Yeah. Yes. One uh, clarifying question. Uh, did I understand correctly uh, that you say around 1800 to 2000 uh, mm -hmm. uh, BC there was uh, all of a sudden a big movement, a uh, migration. Whether this is a migration, you know, you mean the chariot expansion? Well, uh, I heard chariot expansion, uh, I suppose, uh, earlier, 3,000, 2,000. No, no, the chariot expansion is exactly from 2,000 to 800 BC, from the Urals yes. to the Carpathians, and, and, and even further south. And, and that takes place very rapidly. And whether this rapidity is due to to, uh, to um, some kind of conquest, uh, one after the other, or whether these specialists, horse breeders, uh, warriors, carpenters, craft people, they were moving and bringing with them the skills, I don't know. But I can only say it happened very quickly. So there was no uh, argument that uh, it had to do with uh, uh, export of metal? That could be part of it. I think more, David knows more about this than I do. I think it's an expansion of a military technology. It's yes. a brand new military technology, and it clearly spread very quickly. So that could happen without a major migration. But uh, also, there's a lot of details of the gear that are spreading with it. And the more details stay together as a package, the more it suggests that people are moving with it. If it's uh, if it's just uh, the idea of the technology, then it's realized in different ways. In different so, places. so a package at least demands that there are groups of people yeah. who are specialists and, and, and has a know-how to move. What I didn't understand is you said 3,000, 3,500. For young knight, not for chariots. Chariots are a horse riding. Yeah. 
Chariots are invented about 2000. Yeah. 21. Yeah. So these are two separate events. <coughs> yeah. yeah, coming back to the Belbikers and the Kills, I learned from Johannes Müller that the Belbikers started in, uh, in Iberia uh, around 2000. No, 2600. Uh, no. No, two, no yeah, 2000. Yeah. Uh, no. And then arrived in, in northern in, in Scandinavia at the uh, two two or two hundred about that. Uh, uh, two two thousand. Ah yes, two thousand two eight you mean, that's so correct. Yeah. Uh, that are eight hundred years. Mm. Now uh, they mix in Middle Europe uh, with the Cordic bear culture. And uh, after all the Celts uh, spoke a Indo European language. Thus, only the Belgians could uh, furnish could have furnished a substratum language to the Celtic one. That's the only thing I can fancy. And uh, regarding the place names, uh, it's, these are thousand years later in Gallia. You know that it was Celtic then. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but what I want to show with the place names, what I forgot to mention is that they are not to the east, they are not to east central Europe, they don't find them. So the old models suppose of a homeland in, in, in central Europe or in east central Europe, and they don't find the place names. But they may be old or not, you do not know. Yeah, I mean, I mean there are many possibilities. Uh, the evidence, uh, the probability of any hypothesis stands or falls with the power of combining the evidence and the, the ability to account for most of the evidence within a single model. If you can only account for 50% of the evidence in a model or a scenario, mm. then there's still 50% left unaccounted for. Yeah, and, and that doesn't make the, the, the model uh, profitable. So you have to be able to account for a major part of the evidence to make your model profitable. 